I don't want to preach the gospel. See, I'm going to climb in a plane in a couple of days' time that's going to take 14 hours to cross the Pacific. I really hope there's no one sitting next to me. If there is someone living sitting next to me, I hope he doesn't speak English. You know, I don't want to spare the gospel with a person there. I don't want the inconvenience. I don't want to have to talk to them for 14 hours. I, don't, I just want to get in the, in the plane and zone out. That's what I want. Movies, food, sleep, and somehow arrive. That's all I'm interested in. But yet, that's living for myself. That person may be going to hell without the gospel. And I'm worried about missing out my movie. <laughs> See how self-centred that is? And so I get there and I sit down next to him and he's a really clever bloke who knows so much more than I do and he studied it thoroughly. What, who can I be to talk to him about the gospel? I can be the person who's got the very words of God in my mouth. That's who. The words that created the universe and can save his soul. That's who's sitting next to him. And so I've just got to have confidence in the message. The message to proclaim is the declaration that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Saviour and Judge. For with Jesus comes the kingdom and righteousness, mercy and forgiveness, rebirth and eternal life. It's the message we live by. It's the message we die by. For if we live, we've got to believe it, we must live it. And if we live, we must speak it. And therefore, we make it our aim always to please Jesus by serving other people with the message of the gospel. The people who are unconcerned about the lost are generally the lost. If you've been saved, you'll know the wonder of God's grace and mercy and would want it for any and everybody else you ever meet. But it's always painful. The gospel preaching requires me to put my neck out, to actually take risk. I've got a friendship. If I preach really what I believe to them, they may drop me as a friend. Yep. And if I don't, they may never hear the salvation that Jesus has won. Lose your friend. That's the answer to that, isn't it? So you see what evangelism is about in the Bible here? It's not an optional extra for the saved. It's what our Lord wants us to do. That's how he wants us. But it does mean enslaving yourself to others. Putting yourself out for them. That's what it always means. Now, there is the first of those three talks. Um, the second one, I think it's better if we do run this little video because I don't have to do it. Then we'll move to the question time and if we've got time, I'll tell you about the evangelism in the church and 10 points on that, which is fairly simple. But because of this, we have invented training programs, oh, it is, training programs called Two Ways to Live, which are aimed to help Christians understand the gospel in its simplicity. Very difficult to make it this simple and yet accurate. What does it mean to have Jesus Christ as Lord? What does it mean that he saves us? What to make it simple and accurate, but also memorable, so that when you're on the bus, when you're on the plane, when you're in the train, when you're standing in the queue, oh, you guys never get on buses, do you? Sorry. Buses are big things that carry lots of people. When you get on wherever it is, when the person next to you says, Oh, my life's in a mess. I wonder what. You know how to explain the gospel to them. And so we've created a very simple system of gospel explanation, which can be done on a napkin in a, in a, in a restaurant or a cafe. And in fact, I have done it in, in restaurants and cafes. And so we've got a, on the video now, you'll see someone drawing out the gospel and speaking it out. There are a couple of spare chairs here. There are some chairs over there. Oh, don't draw attention to them, please, please. But there, there's a couple further down and we'll put more out for you. Is that right? Are we ready to go with the... Go for it. The text of Two Ways to Live. God is the loving ruler of the world. He made the world. He made us rulers of the world under him. 
You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Revelation 4.11 But is that the way it is now? We all reject the ruler, God, by trying to run life our own way without him. But we fail to rule ourselves or society or the world. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Romans 3, 10 to 12. What will God do about this rebellion? God won't let us rebel forever. God's punishment for rebellion is death and judgment. Man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. Hebrews 9.27 God's justice sounds hard, but because of his love, God sent his Son into the world, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus always lived under God's rule. Yet by dying in our place, he took our punishment and brought forgiveness. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 1 Peter 3.18 But that's not all. God raised Jesus to life again as the ruler of the world. Jesus has conquered death, now gives new life, and will return to judge. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3. Well, where does that leave us? The two ways to live. Our way. Reject the ruler, God. Try to run life our own way. Result? Condemned by God, facing death and judgment. God's new way. Submit to Jesus as our ruler. Rely on Jesus' death and resurrection. Result? Forgiven by God, given eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. John 3.36 Which of these represents the way you want to live? It's a very simple little presentation. Right? But notice that there are the six pages that you... You, six little boxes you put on the, uh, uh, on the one napkin, on the one piece of paper. And it's a method of leading people to Christ. You see, if someone did say to you, good sir, what must I do to be saved? Would you know what to say? This method teaches you what to say. We're just reaching that point right at the end there. But it takes you through the gospel. And you can see in the six pages that are there how the first one, and the fourth one look alike, but the fourth one has Jesus as the man. See, the first Adam and the second Adam are there in those two pictures that you have there. And it takes you through six great doctrines. Uh, creation is the first one. Sin is the second one. Judgment is the third. The atonement is the fourth one. The resurrection is the fifth one. And then the choice of repentance and faith is given in the last one or the command to repent and have faith. But it also, you may not have noticed when he was speaking, because you just noticed the Australian accent, but you may not have noticed, but we didn't use religious jargon either. We didn't use the word sin, uh, except when quoting the Bible. We didn't use the word sin. We talked about rejecting and rebelling against God. We didn't use the word faith. We talked about submitting to God. We didn't use uh, the word creation. We talked about God made the world. It means exactly the same thing. But if you start talking about God created the world, you're inevitably going to have a long discussion about evolution and creation. And there's nothing wrong with having that discussion except you'll never get to Jesus. And our message is Jesus Christ as Lord. That, that's where we want to get to. So we don't want to get sidetracked onto other issues. So we've chosen the wording to avoid jargon, to avoid religious in-talk, and to avoid distractions from keeping the message flowing to where we want to go, Jesus died, Jesus rose, Jesus is king, is he yours? Which is, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. 
That, that's the message that we're preaching, and that's the message that this is taking us through. Now, what we do is we have a training program which helps people go through in small groups and to actually learn it off by heart. Now, the little visual drawings, you see, aid your memory as well as mean that you can control the conversation. As you sit down there and you just draw up six boxes and you say, I've got six things to say to you. No one is so rude at number two to say, well, I've seen enough. They say, well, what's in the rest? And so you're able to present the whole gospel, this mechanism. It's a very simple mechanism to control the conversation, to lead people towards Jesus and the challenge in the last box. And you learn to say it off by heart means you get the gospel into your own mind. And there's a logical flow to it, so you can actually feel the logical flow. It also means that when you're talking about people, you start to recognise what they're saying is box three. That means I've got to go back to and I've got to go forward the rest, you see. And you learn how to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus with people. So that's what two ways to live. It's, it's presented in a little booklet form, but we don't like giving out the booklet form. We'd much prefer people to learn it properly and then just write it as if it's your own. That's what it is. I had a friend, someone told me the other day, they saw it written out and they thought the bloke who did it was a genius. And then a few months later, he discovered that other people were learning the same thing too and the genius hadn't worked it out for himself. It also enables you to be flexible and say it in your own language once you've learned how to do it properly. I have a brilliant illustration to explain that to you but it's cricket, so I won't tell you. You'll just have to miss out on that sub that one. Uh, I'll try. Um, in most sports, when you teach the child how to play the sport, you teach them how to do it orthodoxly. This is the way to hold your baseball bat. This is the way to hold the football. This is the way to hold the tennis racket. And so you teach them the right way to do it. But the really good ones hardly ever do the orthodox things, do they? When you see the top liners, they've learned how to develop it for themselves. But you don't start doing it for yourself. You start the orthodox basic way first. And that's what this does for you. It gives you the basic orthodox outline to which over time you learn your own particular way of expressing yourself and it becomes more natural. Now, if you haven't been trained in how to share the gospel with people, my guess is you won't. You see, we developed this on a university campus many years ago and we took them out into the streets around the university to share it with strangers. And what we noticed was very few strangers got converted. Some did, very few. But we also noticed that the students who shared it with, their, with the strangers saw their friends converted and the students who didn't share it with their strangers didn't see their friends converted. Now, what's the difference? Well, once you've shared it with strangers, you learn how to say it. You hear yourself saying it. You're, you gain confidence in being able to say it. So that when your friend says, why are you a Christian? You know how to do it. You know how to talk about it. But if you've never been trained, you've never said it, you've never had any practice or experience in doing it, then when your friend says, what's this about Christianity? You say, I must tell you someday and you don't actually share the gospel with your friends. So, you want to evangelise? Well, you should if you're a Christian, even though you're scared of evangelism. That's good, because you're a clay jar. That's great. And therefore, you need to be trained in evangelism. Well, there's lots of good courses, but the one we commend is this one, because we think it actually has lots going for it in its, in its package. Now, do you want to ask questions, make comments? At all. I don't care what it's about. It's all right. It doesn't even have to be about what I've said, really. But we'll start on evangelism and move to other things. Yeah. People who, who share basic Christian experience, uh, background, like, uh, like a Roman Catholic, for example, box one, we still got it up, about creation, 
they accept you move very quickly. Box two, they don't hear and understand. They think, yes, sin means I've done some naughty thing sometime, but I'm not really sinful. I'm not sinful. I just have done some sinful things. Right? And the concept of sin being the rejection and rebellion against God is quite foreign to them. They think sin is breaking rules, um, especially about sex. And so because they've broken a rule, they've watched pornography sometime, or they yes, I am a sinful person, I'm a sinner, but, you know, I've confessed that, that's gone, that's dealt with. And so they are constantly looking at the symptoms of sin and never the disease of sin. And therefore, they don't understand why Jesus had to die on the cross for them and they have no assurance of salvation. So when I'm dealing with a Catholic, I know I've got to slow down on box two. And they'll accept it and we'll get right to the end with a Catholic and a religious person. And we say at the end when you're on box six with the two, two little men there, which of these best represents the way you live? And they always want to say, well, I'm somewhere in the middle. And we have to go back and say, no, there is no third way. There's only two ways. Why you think you're in the middle is because you haven't understood box two. You think doing a little bit of sin is acceptable, but you're not sinful. And you don't understand the reason you keep sinning is because you are sinful. Right? Out of the heart of man comes evil and uh, of all manner of lies and, and, and deceit of uh, of greed, uh, of murder, of, of uh, false witness and uh, adultery. It all comes out of the heart. And so you keep on putting band-aids on your cancer. Let's go back and deal with the relationship with God. That's where you move with religious people. Yep. But the beauty of this is you present it. You know where the Roman Catholic is going to go to. You wait for it to happen and then take, it back, take him back to it. Yep, yep. Yep. Uh, how I deal with it, which is not necessarily how it's dealt with in the magazine, you know, uh, in the program, how I deal with it has got to do is, look, this is not just my opinion. This is basic Christianity. And I'll show you where it is in the Bible so that you'll know that it's not just because I'm, you know, I know you find this really difficult, but I'm an Episcopalian. You know, now, if you knew I was Episcopalian, would you trust me? Huh? I mean, would you trust me and be able to tell you the, the, the Christianity message faithfully and loyally? Uh, I wouldn't. Huh? And so I say, no, let me show you that it's not just kind of weirdo Episcopalianism, which is um, uh, a tautology. Um, it's not weirdo uh, Episcopal. This is what the Bible say. However, yes, I've got to be ready to the person who says, well, I don't believe the Bible anyway. Right? I can do it without putting the Bible verses on. I can say, well, these are the six things that Christians believe. Full stop. Or these are the six things I believe. But uh, I like showing them that it's come from the Bible. Two questions. Number one, I'm asking number one, which is not his question. Number one, uh, how many of you have previously seen this presentation of the gospel? Yeah, some of us. Good. Secondly, uh, Ian's question is, how many of you are finding or think the world is in America? I'll talk about it. Ohio, let's be more specific. Youngstown, let's be even more. How many of you are finding that the, that the society around you is more hostile to Christianity now than five, ten years ago. Okay, then we have to have more courage, don't we? How do we move people to be talking about the gospel with us? See, in Australia, it is really hostile. We only have two to three percent of Australians who believe the Bible. 
uh, all go to church in Protestant churches. Uh, so we're in a very different, more hostile environment than yours, um, uh, which is, is sad and it's bad. Australia is a lovely country, but just pagan, hedonism, materialism. Um, that's our country. And so people are very hostile and all the more so because of uh, Muslims, we are put in the same category as the terrorists and Muslims uh, in, in their thinking. I'm a religious extremist. Religious extremists are bad, not Muslims. Religious extremists, there are nice Muslims, you see. And so anybody who believes their religion and puts it into practice, they are the people we don't like. They're the baddies. Uh, uh, whereas all your candidates will, will tell you about their religious belief and use the word God, our candidates never do because you lose votes if you mention that you believe in God in Australia. So we are slightly more down the hostile end of the spectrum than you are. How do you get the talk about, get the people to ask about God. One of the keys is uh, uh, that we use in our training programs is to learn how to talk God talk. Now I don't know how much you need to talk God talk in this context uh, because God gets dropped in conversations left, right and centre. But one of our favourite words in Australia is, do you have a good weekend? It's a good word. Uh, it's one single word, have a good weekend. Uh, uh, which if I slow it down you might actually know it. Did you have a good weekend? It's like, g'day mate, it's just one word, you see. Uh, we're very good at sliding. We keep our mouths as closed as possible because we've got a lot of bushfires, you see. G'day mate, you can say it without opening your mouth. And so you have a good weekend. So when you go back to work on Monday, they say, do you have a good weekend? And to which, if you're a Christian and you're talking to a non-Christian, you say, yeah, I saw the football game, you know, I saw the Steelers beat whoever. And, and so on, you discuss the football. If it's a Christian, you'll say, oh yeah, I was away in a conference and I actually was trained in this, this, this. And so we sanitise our language between the people. We censor ourselves. We're self-censoring. And then we wonder why the non-Christians never talk to us about Christianity when we've actually kept the subject out. And so we train people. You know they're going to ask you. So you don't just say, oh yes, I went to church. Something You've got to do better than that. You say I heard a really interesting sermon about, and then you tell them some of the sermon. Now, that, that trails your coat. They can jump on it or they can ignore it as they want. But at least you're giving the opportunity for the subject to be there and talked about. And so stop self-censoring. Stop God-censoring and develop the skills of being able to just drop not just God but real faith into the conversations that you're involved in, especially when you know Monday morning they're going to ask the question. So set yourself up for, uh, what do you call it, coffee break, the Levenses, uh, whatever it is that you have in this country. Coffee. Set it up for the coffee time. Yeah. Box two does that. Yeah. Well, in Australia, it's simple because we're a convict nation. <laughs> you know, we don't have the great uh, hope of the, uh, of the universe resting on our shoulders. So it's not much of a problem. Whereas you kind of live in psycho babble land, don't you? Where everybody has always got to be self-esteem built up, built up. And every child... I, I, I used to love listening to Garrison Keylor, you know, where all the women are beautiful and all the children are above average. It's a wonderful expression, isn't it, in... Um, what was the name of the place he was? Uh, 
Lake Wobegon, yes, where all the women are beautiful and all the children are above average. Um, I, I enjoyed Garrison Keylord. Sorry if you don't know who I'm talking about, but he is an American. Uh, don't blame me. Um, and so it is a little difficult because there is so much that people call sin good these days. Right? In this whole self-esteem movement. And uh, uh, we sang a hymn this morning uh, where uh, uh, Sandy uh, pointed out to me there was changes in the words, quite significant changes in the words. Uh, Man of sorrows. Um, I can't remember. Come up here and tell us what the words are that were left out, mate. Guilty, vile and helpless we gets changed into something about I like God being close to me. You see, so we're actually even sanitising our hymns in church to, to do away with the, the awfulness of our sinful nature. And certainly that's within the society. And teaching self-esteem is very high in what you do with children. Well, the best self-esteem is the truth. That's the best self-esteem. Right? Because you then don't have to chase the ideal that you're not. Uh, poor, poor young women today and this terrible, terrible problems that come with anorexia, bulimia and the like and finding the perfect shape for themselves and the rest of it. It's a failure to understand box one. God has created me. I am perfect bodily. Is my bodily shape in existence is ab th this is perfection itself. Right? That is, I am the perfect Philip Jensen. I'm not the perfect you, but I'm the perfect... God made me this way. If he wanted me taller, I would be. If he wanted me shorter, I would be. If he wanted me to hang on my hair longer, I would. If he wanted me to have blue eyes, I would. He's just made me the way he's made me, and therefore I can be fully content with me as I am. I don't have to go out and bulk up in order to prove anything, you see. My bodily shape is accepted in the acceptance of God's creation of me. And likewise, I am a wretched sinner. And I've got to sort this out. I've got to, I mustn't be astonished when I do evil things because when I do evil things, I'm doing my natural things. And I need to face that. And so, yes, it's at box one and two we're disagreeing with our community, <laughs> let alone get down to box five and six. That's why you need box one and two. There's no point just telling them Jesus loves you and died for you. They say, oh, whoopee-doo. So what? That's nice. I'm glad. Thank you. It, box one and two is where you're preaching the gospel as much as box four, five, six. And you've got to reason with people and show them. And then I invent all kinds of different illustrations because I can't help it. I'll give you an illustration from uh, uh, my daughter. Um, see, you don't have to teach your children to sin. They know how to do that already. You never have to teach your children. Now, you know, always take the last piece of cake for yourself. You know, keep your own toys. Don't, play, don't let any other children play with your toys. Make, you never have to teach children that, do you? Yeah? Please be selfish. They, they, they get that one completely, don't they? Why, why is it that you don't have to teach children to do naughty things? Because already they are caught up in this human rebellion. So the very first sentence one of my daughters said, the full first full sentence, she stood there with a broken television aerial in her hand and said, my, said Matthew did it. He'd been at school for several hours at this time, but that was her first full sentence, was sin. Yeah. There was a lie. Now, here is a simple illustration to have. You see, here's a sailor, a good sailor, a wonderful sailor. He, he, he does all the right things. He, he always stays on watch. He never gets back to ship late from uh, leave. He always obeys his commands. He does extra courses to know how to make sure he does his work very efficiently. When anybody else is sick in deck, he, below decks, he always takes food to them, looks after them, organises that their shifts are looked after, their watch is looked after. He is the best sailor you could ever have. Now, I'll tell you one more thing about him, and you'll see how you should evaluate him. You see, he's a pirate. He flies under the, the Jolly Roger, under the skull and crossbones. In fact, if he was a lousy sailor, he would hold the cause of piracy back. But because he's such a good sailor, he advocates piracy all the more. You don't judge a person by how well they do actions. You judge a person by which flag they're flying under. 
Are you flying under God's or under yours? Are you in rebellion against God or are you one of God's servants? Because that's what sin is about. Now, it's not breaking rules. In fact, it's making rules for yourself that is the nature of sin. So in preaching the gospel, you see, I'm trying to change people's whole mindset into the way God thinks rather than the way we think. That's the exercise. You can have the, the, you can have the good sailor free of charge, use it, don't have to footnote me, it's perfectly all right. I have a suspicion I, st I stole it from someone else, but so long ago I can't remember. <laughs>